Would you like to know what brass sizing method is going to give you the best performance without wasting tons of components and barrel life? Well, if you stick around for all of today's video, we're going to cover the differences, large and small, when it comes to what sizing method you may want to choose. Now, if you're happy with your process, I have no concern if you change. But if you're trying to get started or you want to see the true differences in these 12 methods of sizing, you are in the right place. Today, we're going to cover six different full length sizing methods and four neck only options in 6.5 Creedmoor. These are combinations of standard full length dies, bushing dies, collet dies, some expander mandrels, and sometimes even a combination of these options. Currently, we're 360 rounds and counting to this testing, and today we're going to cover what we've learned so far. The first thing we set out to understand is if there were any differences on the forces applied to the projectile during the seating process. This is a graph of all 12 seating profiles for each method compared to one another. We learned that the standard full length method with the stock expander in place tended to have these higher initial starting forces. When we use an expander mandrel in place of the stock expander, these tended to bring the peak values down slightly. Despite the differences in initial seating force, both processes seem to maintain overall similar total seating force required to seat the projectile. Bushing dies seem to have two separate peaks in the seating force early on, as well as the entire portion of the neck isn't completely sized during the seating process, and we can see this in the force graphs. Collet dies seem to have a different profile altogether, with similar starting forces, but overall having less total seating force compared to our other options. How does this affect performance? Well, let's find out. Clearly, with all these different methods of sizing, there will be differences besides the neck tension. Let's take a quick look at the case volume numbers from 120 different cases, both fired and sized case volume. Our neck only sizing methods here are shown in red, and they have slightly higher case volume since the body isn't sized. When I first saw this data, I was surprised that the average case volume difference between the neck only and full length size cases was only about 0.3 grains of water. I personally thought it would be more. With the case volume difference being only around 0.3 grains of water, will we see a different pressure when the rounds are fired? Well, I monitored the pressure with my Pressure Trace 2 system during the live fire testing to get the answer to this very question. Our live fire data is all based on LAPA Large Rifle Primer Brass, the CCI 250 Large Rifle Magnum Primer, the Sierra 142 grain Sierra Match King, and Hosgen's H4350. When I fired the velocity strings for all these different methods, this was the chart that was generated. The Forrester bushing bump die was tested on a different day, that's why it's highlighted in yellow. Interesting here is the highest peak pressures are recorded on the neck only size brass. While these numbers aren't extremely different, it is interesting to me nonetheless. It appears that the full length size brass is using some of the energy to expand the brass back out to fill the chamber. How does this affect the velocity? Well, this is where we ran into the first hiccup in the test. Since Sierra had listed our max charge for this load combination at 43.3 grains of H4350, I expected the velocity and pressures to be slightly lower than what we ended up finding. Our test platform has a 26 inch white oak armament barrel, so we did expect to see slightly higher velocities than our published data, because our published data is based on a 24 inch barrel. But our initial velocity strings gave us the following response curves. Interesting enough that our options that used the Lee Collet die for part of the sizing process saw the highest velocities. Velocities got up around 2080 feet per second in those cases, where I really expected to see all the velocities from all of our options stay between the 2700 to 2800 feet per second range. Our prediction using Gordon's reloading tool or quick load to get these types of velocity responses should have seen predicted charge weights higher than we tested. Again, this is why testing is so important. When I first set out to do this testing, I had no interest in testing at the highest case pressures possible, so I ended up testing slightly lower charge weights. These graphs incorporate a retesting a second time, starting down at 40.4 grains of H4350, and retesting the charge weights at 41.1 grains to 41.3 grains. So you will notice two data points repeated on those charge weights. The velocities on our retest are slightly lower on average than our second day for whatever reason. The average velocity for the charge weights of 41.1 to 41.3 grains across all the sizing methods for the first day saw averages from 2794 to 2817, on the second day, the same charge weights gave us an average velocity of 2790 to 2800. All the data points are on this chart, but I did have to remove the labels since it was getting difficult to read them. But picking the charge weight to do our accuracy testing is next. There are two ways to pick it that I see. The first is trying to look at individual charts and picking a custom load for each sizing method. Or, average all the data and see what charge weight has the most consistent velocity among all the different sizing methods. 
This chart shows the velocity response average from all of our different sizing methods. If we looked only at the average velocities, I think there are lots of options to choose from, but if we add our standard deviation to the chart, our choice becomes clearer. Considering the standard deviation data, I'm thinking of starting the accuracy testing out somewhere around 40.9 grains of H4350, but if you think something different, I'm willing to listen as they're sitting right here, ready to load. Our neck only size brass is starting to get a little bit difficult to chamber, so I'm not sure how many more reloads we're going to get before we need to push that shoulder back at least a little bit. But if you want to see what type of accuracy we get, make sure you subscribe to the channel so you don't miss out. If you want to go a little bit deeper on some of the data we talked about today, check out this playlist right here. If you'd like to help fund this crazy testing, think about supporting the channel on Patreon. And until next week, stay safe in small groups.